Hello and good day to you. You see, we don't really ask the question, should we have pizza tonight in our house? Rather, we ask, what are we putting on the pizza tonight? We almost always have some pepperoni. Sometimes we might have some tomatoes, tomatoes. Uh, but after a while, you're mainly limited to things that perish slower. One minute, I have to have a bite of this. Ooh. By things that perish slower, I mean cured meats and things in jars. And let's face it, sometimes you just want a pizza without making a special trip to the local supermercado. So I devise a system that both makes variation easier and actually better tasting also. And also, to be honest, after starting to do this, it really reinvigorated my enthusiasm for pizza. In this video, we will be pickling, roasting, and air fryer dehydrating various foodstuffs. And I'll show you how to make homemade sausage and the most special, special sauce a pizza can get. Roll on with the food. <laughs> I reckon that not a lot of people know that an air fryer can also double as a food dehydrator. Drying out foods is probably one of the most effective and longer lasting methods of preserving any food, simply because bacteria needs moisture to thrive. And it works particularly well on our fungal friends, our mushroom, which is kind of ironic. The kitchen ingredient that probably perishes the quickest benefits the most from the method that allows it to be around for the longest. You can use any old dehydrator, but if you're using an air fryer, it's quite simple you put your mushrooms in on the trays and you set it to dehydrate i think it's about 120 degrees fahrenheit for 10 hours boom come back stick it in a bag and throw in a couple of bags of silica gel if you have them handy which every good cook should mushrooms are a classic pizza topping they add a wonderful flavor but they're the only vegetable that adds a an abundance of glutamates which uh, makes uh, it taste Meaty, without meat. This particular pizza that I'm gonna show you now is one of the most made pizzas in our household, but it can be time consuming and it also necessitates that you have uh, fresh mushrooms in the fridge. And quite frankly, there's times where you have neither of those things. And don't get me wrong, this is probably the ideal way to make it. Saute off some mushrooms in a pan, throw in a little bit of salt to bring out the natural sugars in the uh, mushrooms. Thinly slice some uh, garlic cloves and do the same with those. Then once you've got a nice brown on both the mushrooms and the garlic, throw in a lovely uh, knob of butter in there. And then what goes better with mushrooms, garlic and butter, but goat's cheese, feta cheese and a rosemary. Beautiful combination all around. I actually have a rosemary plant that I've amazingly kept alive for quite some time now, ready for this very application. And once you've cooked off the uh, mushrooms and the garlic and all that stuff, it's an extremely easy pizza to execute with just that one criteria. Sometimes you want this type of pizza, but you don't want to go out to the shop and buy fresh mushrooms or you don't want to sit there sautéing stuff. You just want a quick, easy fix. Here's another recommendation for your pizza pantry, some truffle powder. You can get it off Amazon and I'll put a link in the description, but I got both the truffle powder and the truffle oil off Amazon and they last for ages in the cupboard. So the easy and convenient method of making this is to have some already cooked off garlic, obviously. And you really can't beat roast garlic for its nutty, smooth taste. It's not just convenient, but it's super versatile as well. Having a jar full of roast garlic in your uh, fridge means you can chuck it into a pasta. You can make garlic bread with it in an instant. You can dilute it with a little bit of oil and use it to brush the crusts of your pizza, for instance. And you can really go crazy with it because it's not a harsh garlicky taste when it's roasted. It's super smooth. But all you do is cut some the tops of some garlic bulbs, put them in a pan or a tray with some oil covered with foil on 400 degrees Fahrenheit oven for a good while, like 35, 40 minutes. Remove the bulbs and push those lovely garlics out. Then you add some extra virgin olive oil. If you've seen a good few of my videos, you'll know that I use uh, extra virgin olive oil as a finishing oil. And while it's true that this will be on a pizza at 500 degrees, there may well be times where I wanna use it in a different application, say a salad dressing or just merely spread on uh, bread or, or on pizza crust. So the added flavor of the extra virgin olive oil is a bonus. Now, when I want to make one of these mushroom pizzas, I just grab the dried mushrooms and rehydrate them in some balsamic vinegar. Add a little bit of oil to my uh, couple of spoonfuls of roasted garlic. Use that as a, a lube for the top of the pizza. 
and everything else is basically the same. You put the cheese on, the mushrooms on, the rosemary on, put it in the oven, take it out, then put it into your mouth hole. What makes this all the more magical is that at any time I want, I can make this pizza any time. There doesn't have to be fresh mushrooms in the fridge and I don't need to mess about sauteing stuff like I'm cooking a bloody meal. I can just boom, ba, boom, ski, and out comes a bloody pizza. Bon appetito. Same thing again. Truffle powder and a little bit of truffle oil. And Robert is your father's brother. If I had to guess, I would say that the most used alliums on pizza would be onions, and for good reason, but I actually prefer to use shallots. They are sweeter than their big brothers, but more often than not, there's either spicy or savory elements on every pizza that I make. And then using jalapenos, well, that's just a no-brainer. But with both of these vegetables, there's an easier, more convenient way of keeping, storing, and using them, and it's pickling, and pickling also really elevates both of these ingredients. After you've chopped the vegetables, it probably takes about five minutes. Equal parts vinegar and water and half that amount in sugar, bring it to the boil. I do recommend using a wine-based vinegar just to give it some more taste. Don't ask me why, but I used Szechuan peppercorns for the uh, jalapenos. I honestly didn't see that major of a difference between that and regular peppercorns, but you know, it was worth a try. One bay leaf and then just bring it all up to a boil to dissolve the sugar and pour it over your jalapenos. The one thing I did forget in these shots is the salt, so I added that later. Both the salt and the vinegar are going to um, create a hostile environment for any type of microbes. This is what pres preserves the uh, vegetable. I used balsamic for the uh, shallots because they just seem to jive well. And pink, pink peppercorns because, you know, I'm cool. By all means, just use plain old peppercorns or none at all if you don't want. But pickling vegetables is basically achieving the same result as fermenting them would do which is to preserve them through creating uh, good bacteria that create uh, acetic acid that then kill bad microbes. But we get to actually do it in like five or 10 minutes. Get yourself some of these little mason jars off Amazon. I'll put the link in the description. But I'll show you a quick couple of examples now, one of which has actually become one of my favorite pizzas. And it's this one right here. It's deli pepperoni, pickled shallots, goat's cheese, mozzarella cheese, some dark cherry uh, balsamic vinegar, and then just finish with some uh, basil oil. Just This just basil and extra virgin olive oil. It's absolutely delicious. And then there's not much better that goes with pepperoni than pickled jalapenos. Of course, regular jalapenos are just fine, but the pickling uh, adds some acidity that regular jalapenos just simply do not have and then this right here is how you finish it off in my house and it is with my patented special secret pizza sauce which i'll teach you how to make in the next chapter so my special patented secret pizza sauce is made from none other than everybody's favorite spiky apple. Just like the other toppings that I've demonstrated in this video, convenience was indeed the driving force behind the invention of this sauce, but it's got many other benefits besides. I'll show you how to make it now. Throw the fresh pineapple into a medium to high heat sauce pot with a little sprinkle of salt. This salt is going to draw the sugars to the surface of the pineapple and give us some nice Maillard reaction. And of course, some flavors that you otherwise just don't get from pineapple. Then you throw in the unsalted butter and the granulated sugar. We're really just gonna be melting the sugar down and reducing it somewhat before we add the sherry vinegar. Bring it down to medium to low heat and simmer that for a few minutes. We wanna get it to a more of a syrupy consistency. And then with your handy dandy immersion blender, Blitz it up super, super fine. This finer consistency is so that it squeezes out of the bottle easy. After it's all blitzed up, let it cool down for about an hour, hour and a half. Let it come up to room temperature before you put the extra virgin olive oil in it. Otherwise, you're going to destroy some of the flavor of the oil. And this is the same reason why we had the cilantro in at the very end. Cilantro is one of the more fragile herbs when it comes to volatile compounds or flavor. You never really want to introduce any heat to cilantro. This recipe is a lot like the pineapple I demonstrated in my cracker thin pizza video. But obviously, the execution is different as well as I've added some... Um, more appropriate ingredients as well. Then it's just a case of funneling it into a squeezy bottle. You can get 12 of these eight ounce squeezy bottles off Amazon for a mere $13, just over a dollar each. And I promise you, you'll be using them for a lot of things once you get them in your house. With this sauce, a little bit of prep time, I have a bottle full of tasty pineapple nectar. That's as simple as pulling it out of the fridge and uh, squeezing it onto my preferred pizza of choice. 
In addition to the convenience, there's three major advantages over just slinging pineapple on your pizza. One is that you can use some premium extra virgin olive oil on your pizza because this thing's not being heated up. Number two is using the lovely taste of fresh cilantro for the same reasons. And three is quite simply superior to plain pineapple in every way. And it also offers the divisive fruit more balance and a better route of administration. For me, one of the most quintessential pizza topping combinations is house-made Italian sausage, some type of onion. In this case, we're using those pickled chilots and some roasted red peppers. N nothing in the world beats your own house-made Italian sausage. I'm gonna teach you how to make both. You can have the roasted peppers ready to rock at any time, uh, but the uh, sausage you can make in bulk and keep that in the freezer as well if you want, but you could just treat yourself to sausage every now and then. And roasting red peppers is ridiculously easy. You just put them directly over a flame or if you've got a gas burner you can even use a blowtorch which every good home cook should have a blowtorch for bruleeing and for you know doing things like this look how easily the skin uh roasts or you know burns <laughs> then it's just a matter of putting them in some plastic bags and keeping them airtight and what this will do is it will create a kind of a vacuum inside and the outside of the peppers will naturally peel off some people don't like running the peppers underwater to get all of the black off but because they want to keep the flavor of the roasted peppers but i just like a nice clean red pepper so i i run mine under cold water and then just slice them thin then the next step after that is to just add some kosher salt and mix it into the peppers you can use any salt the salt doesn't matter the salt is one of the things that's going to help us preserve the peppers this inhibits uh, micro growth same with the red wine vinegar and then at the end just some extra virgin olive oil uh, on top of it all not mixed in with it and this will create like a barrier that will uh, prevent air from getting down into the peppers to make sausage, you have to salt cure the meat. Here I'm using equal parts chuck beef and uh, pork shoulder that I had in the freezer from some other projects. And I just mixed 2% of that weight in kosher salt with the meat. And then it goes into the refrigerator for 24 hours. Then after 24 hours, you toast up some fennel seed and one star anise in a dry medium hot pan. We're just getting all those lovely oils out of these seeds. Once they're nice, toasty and warm and your kitchen is fragrant, you can either put them in a mortar and pestle or in a coffee grinder like I'm doing here and grind into a nice fragrant powder. And then it's time to whip out the $50 Sunbeam mixer. Make sure that the grinder parts have been in the freezer for at least half an hour to an hour and then grind the meat up. If you don't want to fiddle around with all the buying a grinder and grinding your own meat, I've had some good success in the past with getting some ground meat and adding the salt to it, 2% of its weight in salt and uh, curing it in the fridge already ground up and it seems to come out pretty decently. Then it's just a case of throwing into the bowl your uh, ground up fennel and star anise, the paprika, the cayenne pepper, the honey and a liberal amounts of cracked ground pepper and then it's time to knead the meat you uh, mix it around and knead it like you are doing bread you see overnight the salt has been breaking down proteins and it creates like a kind of a brine this kneading action with the meat helps it along its way in in achieving that sausagey springy texture and then a little taste of one of the pieces to make sure the meat was done and seasoned correctly and i thought it was so it was time to cook the required amount that i had allotted for my pizza that night which happened to be six lovely little patties some people like putting the sausage on the pizza raw but i just think that's a missed opportunity to get some lovely furons as they're called out of the meat from the maillard reaction and pre-cooking them in a pan but this is what i mean about reinvigorating my enthusiasm for pizza the different combinations that you can make with just the seven or eight or so toppings that i've demonstrated in this video is almost in the treble digits if you uh, make three or four topping pieces what you see on screen here is my end game pizza, end game so far. It's got the pickled jalapenos, it has the house made sausage, cupping pepperoni, and soppressata. And it doesn't disobey the three to four topping rule because the house made sausage, pepperoni, and soppressata are all sausage. So one topping rule. I hope you try out some of these ideas and you have fun exploring loads of new pizza topping possibilities. Thanks for watching this. I'll see you next time.